Hey folks, Chuck Holton here and welcome to the Hot Zone. I am in Kyiv, Ukraine today and I wanted to spend some time talking about can Russia find some way to declare victory from this conflict? As you know, they have been essentially losing almost every battle that they uh, undertake with the Ukrainian forces. Uh, they've been pushed out of many of the places that they initially came into with the hopes of taking over the entire country. That doesn't look like it's gonna happen at this point. Uh, Russia, everyone uh, was saying at the beginning, second largest military in the world. Now we're finding out it may have been the second largest, but it's the second largest World War II era military in the world. And uh, that doesn't compare to the modern weaponry and technology that the West is able to provide to Ukraine. And so a much smaller force to begin with uh, is essentially defeating Russia on the field of battle in most cases, uh, if uh, not all, but uh, in most cases. Russia has continued to refocus their forces on narrower and narrower areas in order to put their combat power into a small enough space that it can actually win. And right now we're seeing some limited gains in certain places while they're sustaining losses in other places to the Ukrainians. So uh, it looks like it's becoming a protracted battle and it's gonna go on for some time. Now, I wanna talk about a couple of things. Number one, why should you care? Let's table that for just a second and talk a little bit about motivations here, both on the Russian side and on the side of the West, because as I've been saying all along, this is not a conflict between Russia and Ukraine so much as it is a proxy conflict between Russia and the West, and Ukraine is the political football in the middle. Ukraine's doing the dirty work of the fighting for the West. Uh, why does the West want Russia to lose? Well, aside from the moral considerations of you don't get to just invade your neighbor country because you don't like some of the people in that country, I'm, we're not even gonna pretend that this is about Nazis. If you still believe that Russia is invading Ukraine because there are Nazis in Ukraine, I don't even know what to tell you at this point. Uh, are there Nazis in Ukraine? A few. There are far more Nazis in Russia than there are in Ukraine, let's put it that way. There are more Nazis in the United States than there are in Ukraine. So uh, the fact that Russia is invading an entire country to wipe out a Nazi influence is just absolute hogwash. It has nothing to do with why they're here. That is propaganda from the Russian side. And, uh, and we're not, I'm not even gonna, I don't wanna even talk about that anymore. Let's talk about the true motivations why Russia has decided, picked this moment to invade their neighbor. Number one, uh, there, well, two things. It's about water and it's about oil, okay? Uh, or, or petroleum. First of all, Russia, because of its geographic makeup, is it, it doesn't have many warm water ports, the ports that are free from ice all the year round. And the reason that they took Crimea in 2014 is because Crimea has uh, Sevastopol, the, the Russian military base there, uh, and it's a warm water port. Now it's still in the, the Black Sea, which uh, is sort of constrained by the Straits of, uh, in Turkey uh, through Istanbul, but at, nevertheless, it's a warm water port and it's vital to Russian strategic interests. Uh, and they have to keep that port. But when the Russians took over Crimea in 2014, Crimea got most of its water from the, from, from the Dnieper River in Ukraine. And there was a big, long canal that, uh, you know, diverted water away from the Dnieper that went into uh, Crimea. And when Russia took over Crimea, the Ukrainians said, well, you know what, screw you guys. And they poured that canal full of cement and blocked it off. Russia wants to retake the area where that canal is so that they can open that back up because they had a large reservoir of water in Crimea, but it has steadily run out of water. And it's, they, they say now it's at about 7% capacity and probably only has less than six months left of, uh, of water supply. Uh, and if they run out of water in Crimea, it's gonna be 
very difficult for them to maintain that naval base in Sevastopol. So that's one major reason why they wanted to take that southern area across, uh, the, like say, the land bridge from uh, Crimea, the Donbass region, across all the way to Odessa, and then connect Transistria and maybe even take Moldova at some point and start connecting those dots of Russian influence. Russia, like every country, wants to expand its interests. And Putin sees a weak presidency in the United States and says, this is the time to do this. If we're ever going to do it, we have to do it now. The other reason is petroleum. Russia gets about 40% of its government's revenue from the petroleum industry uh, as, as has been said before, Russia is really kind of like uh, a gas station masquerading as a country. Um, they're one of the largest oil, oil and gas producers in the world. They provide uh, more than half, or they did provide more than half of the petroleum products to, uh, especially natural gas, to uh, Europe. Europe doesn't have much gas of its own, and so they, they got it through this elaborate series of pipelines coming from Russia, uh, and Russia was very happy to, to provide that. Um, however, the, Ukra in, in, the U Ukrainian uh, natural gas fields have been steadily being proven over the, since probably about 2013 uh, across Ukraine, and they, especially in the East, there are large deposits of natural gas. I say something like 39 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in the regions where Russia is attacking and, uh, and holding right now. The 20% of the country that Russia currently holds uh, actually holds the majority of the proven natural gas reserves in Ukraine. Now, if Ukraine had been able to develop those natural gas reserves, they could present a large amount of competition to Russia uh, in the natural gas space to provide natural gas to uh, Europe. And Europe would be very glad to get that gas over Russian gas because of the political ramifications of getting it from Russia. So uh, Russia didn't want that to happen, couldn't, you know, couldn't have that. And Russia may actually, it, it, we see now that they're sort of digging in, they're going on the defensive. Uh, they've taken that 20% of the eastern part of Ukraine which includes most of the proven natural gas reserves. And now they're starting to dig in. So there's not a lot of spaces where they're continuing to push, but the, most of those reserves being in the Eastern portion and in the Black Sea, Russia has taken those areas. They're, they wanna hold those areas now and keep that from being developed by Ukraine so that they can continue to be the preeminent natural gas and, and petroleum supplier to Europe and to the rest, you know, lots of places around the world. Um, unfortunately for them, uh, this uh, whole event has kind of become a self-fulfilling prophecy in that it has caused the West to take a really hard look at its dependence on uh, petroleum products from Russia and has taken lots of steps now to divorce itself from that uh, dependence and find other sources for energy. That then is making it worse for Russia than if they hadn't invaded. And in the long run, Russia has already lost this conflict because of that. But they may, if they can take that natural gas area uh, the, the reserves, for, there's some in the Carpathians and that sort of thing, but most of it is in the East and in the Black Sea. If they can take and hold that and keep the Ukrainians from uh, developing it, to them, to the, to the Russian way of thinking, that's a, a win. Uh, maybe a small win, maybe a, a Pyrrhic victory because they're losing uh, the, the supply or the, the demand from, from Europe now, but they're developing other uh, sources and so they think that they can mitigate that to a large extent. Whether or not they can remains to be seen. 
Now, what's the West's motivation for being involved in that? Uh, it, it, uh, again, aside from the moral considerations of uh, supporting a country who is being uh, unjustly invaded by its neighbor. Uh, again, if, if you have a business and somebody opens a similar business right next door to you, that's bad. It's bad for you. It's competition. And, uh, you know, you could complain about it and grumble about it, but you don't have a right to go next door and burn down your neighbor's business. Uh, and that's essentially what Russia is trying to do to Ukraine. And so from a moral standpoint, we should stand with Ukraine and support them in, in many ways. But why else would we want to be involved in this conflict in the way that we are? Well, it has assisted the United States and the West in understanding the Russian capabilities, military capabilities, and given us an understanding of their capabilities we didn't have before. And what it's shown us is that Russia had this very large military, but it was very poorly maintained, poorly trained, poorly led, all those things I've talked about before. And so that presents an opportunity for the West to so cripple the Russian war machine that it won't really be a threat to, uh, to the West for generations to come. And so if we can cripple them now, uh, they're going to be unable to present the kind of threat to the West that we thought they were. Now, again, that may backfire because in pouring so many weapons into Ukraine, so, many, so much military equipment, materiel, and technology, that stuff is durable and fungible. Much of it will be, without a doubt, uh, captured by the Russian forces and then either used against us by them or sold to other parties who will use it against us. Maybe not now, maybe not next year, maybe, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50 years from now, we will be facing our own weapons uh, from, all, who knows? It could be Africa, it could be Libya, it could be Vietnam. We don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter. That the weaponry will make its way around the world and will make the whole world less safe. So that's uh, sort of a bad thing. It's a, it's a calculated risk that the West is taking by, by doing this. And um, the other thing is just sort of an economic consideration. There are tons of countries in the West who are seeing this as an opportunity to upgrade their weaponry, their military capabilities for free, because if they give their, you know, Soviet Union era weaponry to Ukraine, then the United States will gladly replace that weaponry with more modern weaponry and planes and tanks and things like that for free or for a greatly diminished price. So they get a big discount on upgrading their militaries and they all like that idea. So uh, there are reasons why the West is, is doing this. There are reasons why Russia is doing this. Very few of those reasons are the actual reasons that you're hearing from those governments, those respective governments, uh, why they are doing it. But there are actual legitimate reasons. And last question I want, last thing I want to address is, you know, it, why if the U.S. is going through the thralls of inflation, the, the thralls of an economic downturn, uh, why are we sending $40 billion worth of stuff to Ukraine? Um, well, you, you heard what I said there, the, the, the U.S. government feels like it's worth it to invest this money now in hobbling the Russian war machine and that maybe it will pay dividends in the future that we won't have to uh, spend so much money on our own defense because Russia won't be that much of a threat. Whether or not that is a good gamble remains to be seen. The bottom line is it's very expensive. We're spending money we don't have. And so uh, there's a legitimate argument to be made that it's a waste of our time and money and that maybe we shouldn't be so involved. Maybe we should let uh, NGOs be involved in humanitarian or stuff, but that's about it. But um, I, that remains to be seen. All right. I'm Chuck Holton uh, coming to you from Kiev, Ukraine. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Please share it with your friends. ChuckHolton.Locals.com. We'll see you later.